Good morning. I am House, Rep House Minority Leader Lisa Damoth, and thank you, each one of you, for being here. We are here this morning to talk about a very important issue, an important issue here in Minnesota, and that's about keeping our students and our schools safe. That has to be our top priority, and that should never be partisan. But the reason we stand before you this morning is that our schools need to be that safe environment for everyone, students, staff, our communities. Having a school resource officer at the school is a critical way that we can keep our schools safe. The consequences of the new law that is concerning that you have heard about and you will hear more about this morning that is being pushed through our schools, it is actually pushing our school resource officers out of the districts such as Moorhead, Anoka, Coon Rapids, Andover, Rockford, Redwood Falls, St. Louis County, and others that are still making their decisions. And they're gonna potentially start the school year off without a school resource officer. Our school officials and law enforcement officers warned that this would potentially happen if this law was not changed. So we stand before you this morning after asking Governor Waltz for a special session to address just this issue. We stand before you with concerns and a fix of how we could fix the concerns that we have on this law. This is about allowing our school resource officers to use the de-escalation tools that they are trained in because we know that we all in Minnesota want schools that are safe and su successful for all of our students. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Representative Jeff Witte for more information. Good morning. Uh, I'm Representative Jeff Witte, and I have the uh, privilege to serve Lakeville 57B. I'm a former police officer, and I had the great opportunity to serve as a school resource officer. Um, it's a passion of mine and this, the safety of our kids, teachers, and schools should always uh, come first. Mom and dads count on us to safeguard their children. This law makes our kids, teachers, and schools less safe and needs to be fixed before the school starts. Let's work together, and hopefully Governor Walls uh, will be a part of that by declaring a special session so our kids and solve this issue via the special session to prevent more school districts from losing their school resource officers. We all agree we need to bring clarity to the language and make this less ambiguous. That's the confusion you're seeing within the police departments. Some are and some aren't, and the laws are, as they're interpreting are very difficult. As a former officer, I had that opportunity, and it's important uh, to have an officer on site to be a resource for school staff, respond to challenges, prevent problems, and build relationships. That's the most important part here, is build those relationships, working together, um, using all of our resources within the schools so we can keep them safe. SROs play a critical role in keeping our schools safe, and now is not the time for partisanship or political uh, Political games, we need a special session, we need to get over uh, swift action and get our SROs back in the school. I'm going to share a story with you. When I was a school resource officer about 25, 30 years ago, um, we had 2,700 students for three grades. And there was an outstanding football player who played guard and wanted to go to college. But he was involved with the gangs, and he wanted his school to be safe. And this shows the character of him and his heart and he would come into my office to eat candy. Thank God he loved candy, because he would come in and talk with me. And what he did was share information where incidents might happen. That's us working together. That's us coming together by building relationships, building trust. And by that power, I would show up at these different spots, and, and people are like, oh, this guy must be Superman. Where is he getting it? It is because we built this relationship and trust, and we were able to keep the school safe, and he could continue to be a student and a star athlete. 
our SROs help uh, students um, and keep everyone safe. We need to make um, sure schools are safe for everyone and schools learn, and, and the students learn better when our schools are safe. We have an opportunity here to do the right thing before uh, school starts. Let's come together and get this SRO issue um, fixed so that our kids and teachers are safe as they uh, return to the classroom to have a successful uh, school year. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Padani. I'm the police chief and director of safety services in the city of Blaine. We have three school districts in Blaine that we work with, the Anoka Hennepin School District, the Centennial School District, and the Spring Lake Park School District. In each of our districts, we have phenomenal collaborative work, working relationships with not only the students, but the staff and the administration as well. Anyone who knows me knows that I make an effort to focus on the issues at hand and not take a partisan stance. I'm here today on a critical issue affecting our children and our schools. As not only a peace officer, but a parent of children in our public schools, I'm passionate about working together for the safety of our children. We are all entrusted with that responsibility. We're at a crunch time for this. With the end of summer, we have Minnesota certainties. Hot weather, our great Minnesota get together, and the return to school for our children. Unfortunately, return to school has been overshadowed by the issue that brings us all here today. The last few weeks have given rise to extensive discussions regarding the safety of our schools and the impact of the legislation in question. Regardless of how anyone feels about the legislation, what has been clear is the need to fix it. The varying interpretations have created confusion about how to respond to and manage incidents in our schools. Our Attorney General Keith Ellison even issued binding guidance attempting to clarify a portion of the confusion. However, he also indicated that the questions we continue to have are, quote, more appropriately directed at the legislature. It's hard enough for our educators and our peace officers to manage at times chaotic, violent, and unusual situations involving our children and their safety. Having to navigate the legal confusion surrounding that in a split second sets everyone involved in that situation up for failure. This is particularly true when our SROs and contracted officers are called upon by school staff when a situation has escalated to a point educators can no longer manage or handle it. The SRO comes with a skill set and tools as a licensed peace officer the educators do not have. I'm not going to tell a teacher how to teach algebra. I'm going to count on them to have their skill sets and tools and to teach algebra. Our SROs have to be counted on for their skill sets and tools as well, particularly in times of crisis. This legislation has, in essence, had a reverse effect. Our SROs have the most genuine direct connection and time to invest with our students in the multitudes of situations where they may have to de-escalate behaviors. Yet now they are being called upon to not only not get involved in situations, but rather rely on patrol officers to respond and handle them if police assistance is needed and there's not an obvious threat of bodily harm or death. Despite patrol officers also attempting to de-escalate and manage situations, they do not have the relationships and vested time to resolve these tense matters. This can actually result in an increase in physical confrontations. In restricting our SRO's abilities, we have created a result that is inverse to the intent of the legislation. We all agree that nobody wants to put hands on students. This isn't about neck restraints. Those are already illegal by statute for cops barring a deadly force situation. We don't advocate or teach that. However, there are many situations that occur every day in our schools requiring intervention by staff or by law enforcement. What I truly appreciate about this entire issue is that everyone involved here is trying to do what's best for our youth. We all have the same goal. The question is how do we get there? Despite guidance from the Attorney General as well as the League of Minnesota Cities, and our own respective city attorneys, there remains trepidation and confusion from the law enforcement community, as well as our education community. Over the last few weeks, I've spoken extensively with other law enforcement agencies across the state, as well as those from the education community. Well, we may, we may all be taking unique stances with to work around this legislation. What has been clear is mutual concern about its impact. We shouldn't be relying on workarounds to keep our schools safe. 
I'm not here to finger point or place blame, nor am I calling on anyone else to do so. Our children, our educators, and our communities don't need that. What we do hope for is immediate engaged dialogue with all the parties involved to do what is best for our children. We collectively owe it to them. I want to thank all the legislators, districts, professional organizations, and residents who have contacted and worked so hard to bring attention to this challenge. I believe together we'll resolve this and continue to make our Minnesota schools the safest, greatest schools in this country. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Holmberg, and I'm the superintendent of Centennial Schools. Centennial Schools serves the communities of Blaine, Circle Pines, Centerville, Lexington, and Lionel Lakes. I want to thank Chief Padani and others today for their remarks and for their advocacy on this very important issue for our schools and our communities. Safety and security in our schools for our staff and students is our number one priority. Our learning environments need to be safe in order for students and staff to focus on learning. In Centennial, we have a strong, long-standing partnership with our local law enforcement partners with Blaine, Centennial Lakes, and Lionel Lakes. This partnership is essential to creating and maintaining a safe learning environment for our staff and students. The district currently has two SROs, one office at Centennial Middle School through Lionel Lakes Police Department and the other at Centennial High School through the Blaine Police Department. These officers provide support to all of our schools in the district, staff, and students throughout, to, throughout the year to ensure a safe and secure learning environment for our students. School resource officers have an important role in our schools through building strong relationships and working collaboratively with, collaboratively with our students, staff, and our families. Additionally, Centennial Schools also has a longstanding partnership with Anoka County Corrections to provide support and educational to students at the Pine School and programs in Anoka County Corrections in Lionel Lakes. This partnership is equally as important and valuable. Under the current law, there are questions regarding the role of SROs, which restricts their ability to use force or use of restraints. The potential impact to Centennial is the possibility of our school resource agreements being suspended and SROs being pulled out of our schools. In turn, this may have an impact on the safety and security measures in place at our schools. It is absolutely essential that we have strong community partnerships between the police department, school district, and other agencies on issues that impact all of us. We collaborate regularly with community safety and law enforcement partners to review our safety and security measures and implement our crisis management plans to keep our student staff and campus safe. These happen through day-to-day -day interactions. These efforts will certainly continue, but the possibility of not having an SRO to serve as an important liaison to our ongoing efforts in partnership and safety is not a desired outcome for us. The SRO is an in in integral part of our district and community's efforts to keep our students, staff, and facilities safe. The point of today is to continue to advocate for safety and security in our schools and seek additional clarity, and more importantly, a solution on this topic so that school resource officers can perform their roles effectively and successfully. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Kroon. I'm the state senator for District 32, which is Blaine, Ham Lake, uh, Columbus, and Lexington. And um, this issue hits my district particularly because um, Going into the school year, three of the four high schools that serve the students in my district are likely to be without SROs uh, this school year, uh, and several middle schools as well. And um, so I would just, first of all, like to thank Chief Padani and Superintendent Holmberg for their leadership on this issue and for appearing here today. I've had several conversations with them over the last uh, several days, um, and every time I've spoken with them, um, the, their passion for keeping our kids and our uh, educators safe in school is very apparent. So thank you for coming today. Um, prior to being on the Senate, I was uh, on the Spring Lake Park School Board, and my experience with SROs um, was overwhelmingly positive. Um, the community that I serve very, very much supports our law enforcement and our SROs, and they want and expect our SROs uh, to be in schools this fall. 
Our community knows the SROs to be the dedicated professionals that they are. They know that they keep our kids and teachers safe in school. They recognize the relationships. We've heard a lot about relationships. They recognize those relationships that these SROs are able to establish with the students. Um, and that helps with de-escalation. And it really does reduce violence in our schools. Um, and they also recognize the positive role models that these SROs are and that they are building community. And they're a bridge between law enforcement and our young people, which is so desperately needed right now. And so that's why I'm just very terribly disappointed in the legislation, uh, the changes that were made. Um, in my view, um, it strikes me as a solution looking for a problem. And the good news is, is that it's not too late. Um, the governor can call a special session, uh, pass legislation that we're sponsoring to repeal these changes, get our school resource officers back in the school protecting our kids and our teachers. And if there are changes that need to be made next year when we start session again, those changes can be done in a very deliberate manner, um, going through all the proper committees and making sure that law enforcement has a seat at the table this time. Thank you. Uh, good morning and thanks for being here. My name is Zach Duckworth. I represent Senate District uh, 57. Uh, first off, I want to start off by thanking our law enforcement folks for being here and our school resource officers who are not only here but out there and actually serving our community. They do great work and we very much appreciate all the work that they do. Um, to the moms and dads out there who might be a little bit anxious uh, regarding the news they've heard in terms of school resource officers maybe not being in some of the school buildings like they have been in the past, I want to assure you, we hear your concerns. We're working to address this and fix this as quickly as possible in a truly bipartisan fashion. Uh, and I also want to let teachers and school staff know out there, we take your safety extremely seriously as well. We know that you uh, enjoy having school resource officers in your buildings to keep you and students safe. That's why we're here today. That's the singular issue, the singular focus we have here today. The safety of our kids, teachers, and schools should always come before partisan politics. Minnesotans expect us to govern responsibly. Moms and dads count on us to safeguard their children. The confusion surrounding this law is causing a growing number of school resource officers to be pulled out of schools across our state, leaving students and staff vulnerable in cases of emergency. I'm joining others in calling on the governor to bring Republicans and Democrats together for a special session before school starts so that we can fix this issue, keep our SROs, and ensure our kids are safe. The urgency is real. It's unacceptable to parents that the legislature would wait six or more months to address this immediate concern. There's no time to spare when it comes to the safety of our kids. Let's show some bipartisanship and put our kids first. And we've already started some of that work. Um, I took the liberty to have a bill drafted that would fix this issue. It's very simple. As a matter of fact, the bill is one page. It's about four lines, about 20 to 30 words. We could have a special session and very quickly pass this law, which would alleviate all the concerns that you heard from law enforcement folks here today, from school officials here today, from teachers and from parents. This is a time when we can truly come together as Minnesotans, regardless of your party, regardless of your political beliefs, and do what's right on behalf of our kids, teachers, and schools. That's why we're here today. That's why we're at, extending our hand to the governor to join us and help fix and alleviate this issue now rather than later. Uh, that being said, I think at this time we're open for any questions that y'all might have. It seems like the big concern here is ambiguity with this law. Are you able to point to a specific line or portion, one or two lines that you're concerned about and that police officers are concerned about as it pertains to what's written in this law where you say, this is what we have issue with right here? Sure, I'll take a step at it first and I'll invite anybody uh, from the law enforcement uh, community to come forward and cite anything that they have a specific concern with. And what I would invite you to do is go back uh, to uh, the hearing that was held in the Education Policy Committee all the way back in February, where during that committee I cited the very specific lines in this bill I thought were going to be an issue. Uh, when I recommended to the bill author, when I recommended to the Minnesota Department of Education, when I recommended to the folks representing the governor's bill, that they needed to dive deeper into the language and have conversations with law enforcement and school officials to prevent the very situation we're experiencing now. 
And I'm not here to cast blame. I'm more interested in helping to fix this, uh, but this was not a surprise. This issue was raised back in February. It's public record. If you go back and look at that video, you will hear me cite the very specific lines in which I raised concern. Why did you hold this press conference now? Why, why did you, you hold this press conference then? I don't feel like you answered the question. Sure. Can you, can you, raise, can you answer the question now, or do we have to go back to February to, to hear the answer of what are the one or two specific lines that you're taking sure. issue with? I don't have the lines in front of me currently. If you look at the bill that's drafted, it references those lines and would repeal them and come about with the fix. Could anyone answer the question as to what is the one or two specific lines that people are taking issue with as far as the law is right now? Hi, Brian Padani again. Um, Again, I don't have the actual bill in front of me, but the, the, some of the primary concerns, certain from law enforcement standpoint, removing the provision of or um, when we're talking about using any type of force at all, okay? Um, where now um, to use force, certainly we don't want to use force, let's agree on that, okay? But it, it, it took the, the statute to, a, first of all, it applied it to school resource officers who are governed as peace officers. We are governed by a completely separate set of rules in regards to use of force under 60906. The, um, but by taking that out and saying the only time force is acceptable is when there is a threat of bodily harm or death, okay? There's a lot of situations that come up where the threat of bodily harm or death may not be immediate, but they are an escalating situation. Some examples of that may be, um, this, let's say there's a student who's been expelled who's trespassing, or at a football game. We may have three, four, five, six officers working at a football game. We have students that are being disorderly, maybe throwing bottles out on the field, um, causing a ruckus. Generally, what we will try to do is get them to leave um, or tr trespass them from the school property. Um, we cannot do that physically. We actually would have to call officers in off the street who are governed by other rules in this statute to manage that situation then. So the cops are calling the cops. It's just... So, so would that not raise to the level well, of not, physical Maybe harm. not at people. Throwing a bottle on the field, not in the direction of people. Just being drunk and disorderly. We have students who are drunk and disorderly at football games all the time that we have to remove. And that's just one example. Um, another example may be... When you, as a school resource officer or a staff member, walking on the hall and there's two kids standing there talking, that starts to escalate, start arguing, okay? Eventually a group starts gathering around. Everybody's chanting, fight, fight. People are taking out their cell phones. Eventually, maybe they start pushing. Eventually, it comes to throwing punches, whatever that may be. At what point are we seeing in that confrontation, we now have a threat? Is it when they're standing there talking? Is it when they start to argue? Is it when people are standing, chanting, fight, fight? Or is it when they actually start pushing and throwing punches? You somehow have to make that delineation. You don't want to go too early. You know, the way it was before, staff members or school resource officers would interject themselves, push through the crowd, say, all right, knock it off. It's time to, we're going to take this down to the office, okay? You can't physically intervene now until it's potentially too late. And if you don't intervene soon enough as a police officer, you could be liable. But if you intervene too soon, you could be liable under this statute. It creates a no-win situation in law enforcement. So, so that's so. just then that it's being proposed to repeal what's new? To repeal these provisions of the education policy bill. And again, it's 300 and some pages, but just this specific provision. And I can let the senator speak to that. But that's what this bill is for. This so. takes away the bear hug. No. Bear hug could be a, comp a compressive restraint. You know, we talk about prone and compressive restraints. The Attorney General talked about the reasonable standardness. We were already governed by the reasonable standard, okay? So why did we have to legislate this if we were already governed by that? That's the confusion. I understand if that was a legislative intent, that was already applied to officers. So why is that necessary now to redraft this? So the difference between 2021 was a chokehold and this is a prone restraint? Uh, any type of compressive or prone restraint, the way it reads, um, again, I don't have the language in front of me, but it could be a pressure applied to the torso, and it doesn't have to be sustained pressure. It doesn't mean that we're, you know, we don't want to sit on top of someone. If we have to take someone down to handcuff from them as law enforcement, once we have the situation under control, we try to get them back up and secured as quickly as we can. But even just putting them down for a second is now, you know, considered prone to compressive restraint, which um, should already be governed by the reasonable reasonableness standard that we were previously governed by as law enforcement, so. Hey, can I ask the uh, members, House and Senate, was there an attempt to amend in committee or floor? And if so, um, 
Was there a vote specifically on this issue as opposed to the bill in general? Uh, so other than the concerns being raised during a committee hearing when we saw it for the first time, I'm not aware of any amendment uh, that was offered or any specific floor debate. Uh, typically what would happen specific to a provision like this in a bill is it would, it would go through either the Public Safety and or Judiciary Committee, which I, I, I understand at least on the Senate side it did not do. That's where something like this would get the full consideration uh, that it should be by the experts and professionals that should be weighing in on a topic like this to include law enforcement, school resource, uh, resource officers, what have you. Uh, I think what happened is, and it may have been an honest mistake, I don't know, uh, is it, it didn't go through the appropriate process that would have vetted it, caught this, and allowed us to further examine it, potentially head off or correct it before it became law, and now we're dealing with the second and third order effects. And it didn't seem like that would have been uh, a good amendment to offer on the floor if you were aware that it was still in the bill after your warning to just make a move to amend that on the floor? I would have gladly offered it. When you had this in conference committee, Senator, mm -hmm. um, you, you didn't raise objections during the conference committee. It was just because the bill was just so huge and there were other things to talk about. Was that it? Uh, well, if, if I recall, and I, I think I said this even during the hearing, um, we were running low on time, and typically I would ask questions, but instead of doing that, I just gave my feedback directly, and some of that feedback I gave was specific to this, uh, this section. Um, you know, as a, a former school board member myself, I'm aware of these situations, have worked with school resource officers in the past, have experienced having them in the schools as a student, uh, and I saw it as a potential uh, issue that we should have gotten more feedback on. Uh, so that we wouldn't find ourselves in the situation we find ourselves today. I got a question from a reporter watching online from the forum, April Baumgarten. She want to know, can law enforcement train school resource officers to follow the new law, and if not, why? I would assume that's for me. <laughs> um, well, a couple of different things. Well, first of all, it goes contrary to the existing training that we already have. And it forces those school resource officers or contract officers, that's not just our school resource officers, even if we could isolate that, um, but we have any time an officer is contracting to provide security type services at a football game, a school dance, a basketball game, a hockey game, whatever that school function may be, it affects that. And now we are looking at trying to apply different sets of standards. And in a dynamic, dynamic confrontation, we don't now have to be thinking through that, oh, wait a minute, am I doing this? Are these students or not? If you have an incident occurring outside the school, maybe in the parking lot, maybe at a football game, am I dealing with students or not? What set of rules am I being governed by right now? Um, and we shouldn't have to make those types of decisions. We're governed as peace officers. We have those tools and skill sets, and it does create a challenge because they are, it is forcing officers to think, wait a minute, what am I doing? And even um, the agencies that are um, choosing to put school resource officers back in, I'm not faulting them for that, but everyone that I've talked to has said we are trying to basically have them turn a blind eye to situations that don't rise to that bodily harm um, or, or death level. And as peace officers, it goes completely contrary to the intent of what a peace officer does, even in a school setting. So. Questions that were not answered by the Attorney General's opinion. What are those questions? Oh, a couple of different questions. Understanding truly what when is an officer contracted, um, but then also that provision of um, removing the bodily harm or, or removing the 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 word or out of the out of the law that says it can only be in situations involving bodily harm or death. We are looking for clarifications and basically um, my interpretation and our interpretation of the Attorney General's opinion is that those are questions best left to the legislature to decide and to assess, which is why we're requesting a special session to have the legislature clarify intent on that and we request it to be removed, but if that removed, but if that's um, the intent is to keep that in there, uh, obviously we have a concern with that, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. So. Is there a number or a full list at this point of agencies that have pulled SROs or the number of schools that will be without school resource officers that previously had them? I can speak locally. Um, I've spoken to agencies across the state, and some of them were cited um, in, the op in the previous remarks. Um, specifically, um, I'm pretty in tune with Anoka County. Virtually every agency in Anoka County or district, short of one that's still waiting to be determined, has either um, removed their SROs or terminated those contracts or not entered into MOUs for the upcoming school year. 
Um, so because a lot of them go year to year for their contract services. So in Anoka County, we have 10 police departments in the sheriff's office. And uh, again, um, not every one of them has a school resource officer, but most of them do provide some type of contract services. And short of one agency that's still waiting to be determined, everybody is either um, terminated or, or will not be signing those contracts or is recommending to their governing bodies to do that, which is where we're at in Blaine. So. It seems like the biggest concern from a law enforcement standpoint is that you're going to leave yourself open to some sort of lawsuit or, or litigation should you take force against the students and then a parent comes forward and provides a, a lawsuit. Would you say that's the biggest thing holding you it's back at this point? A, it's absolutely a concern. That is one of the key concerns. Even the, and the other key concern is if we are not authorized to use force, does that then open us up to some type of criminal sanctions as well? So if an officer does use force in a situation where the claim is that this, this was violated, now are we looking at a potential assault charge on that officer? So as potential criminal charges, but then there's also the civil piece of it as well, where are they liable for not only interceding in a situation, but potentially not interceding in a situation as a peace officer when they could have prevented something from happening that led to violence? out? I don't want to have to hold out at all. Um, we are trying to, um, again in Blaine, we are um, having a city council meeting tomorrow to discuss this and my recommendations in conjunction with our city attorney recommendations. We are trying to establish some type of workaround so we can still provide some type of safety to the schools in a non-contractual form, which is certainly, again, I think that has an, an inverse effect of what the legislation is supposed to do. We're trying to make the schools safer. We're all backing out now saying, wait a minute, how can we expect our staff to go to, to the school and, and work there every day when they're constantly worried about being sued or whatever it may be, instead of just focusing on their job and developing those relationships and maintaining that safety in the school? Oh. This doesn't apply to officers who are going to respond to a 911 call, so Correct. is one work around having the officers just hover outside the building and go in and there's a call? Yeah, or a school, a lot of the agencies that I've spoken to that have school, that are putting their school resource officers back in the school under contract, um, their, base, their direction is if it's not, uh, if a situation you're requested to assist with does not involve the threat of bodily harm or death, don't get involved, call the patrol officers in to, to handle it. Again, I think that's ridiculous because now our our SROs who know the students and have the relationship with them and are able to invest the time to de-escalate are being told to back up and wait for the patrol officers to come in and manage it. And so that's unfortunate that um, it's a tough decision. Um, but we, you know, we're trying to protect our children, but we're also trying to protect our staff as well. Oh. Officers have qualified immunity. So, so, I mean, and that, on, like, you know, generally mm -hmm. um, absolves them of legal liability. So are you saying that that's a concern here? Why would Paul Not completely. We're still liable. We can still be sued. Um, we can okay. still be sued for virtually anything, but I mean, you know, so, okay. Among the legislators up there, are any of you having conversations with DFLers behind the scenes? It says bipartisan, proposing a bipartisan bill. Do you have any DFL support? Is there any urgency on their side? Uh, the answer to your question is yes. Um, so obviously in trying to find a solution for this and craft a bill, I wanted to have it be bipartisan if possible. So I, I did reach out to a colleague, a DFL member of the Senate who has uh, said they support this measure and will sign on to the bill. So I fully intend that when it's dropped, it will be a bipartisan bill. Uh, they see a need for this fix as well. Stu uh, student safety, school safety, uh, like I said before, I think is a bipartisan issue that both parties agree on, uh, and they're interested in seeing this fixed as well. This is impacting uh, districts in which you have both Republicans and Democrats representing the schools and the school buildings there. Uh, the, the list of schools that are removing school resource officers is growing. I, can, I probably can't give you an accurate count because it's probably changed and increased between the last time I saw it and right now. And what we have to remember is, whether it's a dozen, 15, 20 school resource officers that get pulled out of buildings in the immediate future, every building represents hundreds of kids and staff. So what one school resource officer is helping to keep hundreds of kids and staff safe. If we have a dozen or more that are no longer showing up in school buildings, we're talking about thousands of Minnesota students and teachers and staff who are no longer as safe as they were before this law was passed. That's the issue that we're trying to fix and address here. One quick question on the just kind of wholesale removal of officers from schools in response to the legislation. So much of what we've heard here today 
in terms of the benefit of having an officer on campus, building those relationships, having an ear to the ground, having nothing to do with restraints. So in these very narrow circumstances, and maybe a law enforcement official would be willing to speak to this, what is the sort of push-pull here in terms of, you know, you have all this benefit of being in the schools and knowing what's going on, and suddenly you're just kind of pulling out completely? What's kind of the, you know cost-benefit analysis there. So if I may briefly, I think you're asking sort of what's the context surrounding the law? What's the why behind it? And the best way I can answer that is by quoting the governor from yesterday. This is what he said. The one thing about this law is we don't know how many times this has happened. He went on to say, I don't think there's, a sing I don't think there's been a single case ever in Minnesota history where a school resource officer was brought up on anything. And I can't recall a situation where a student where excessive force was used on them. So I think this is a concern that's out there, but I don't think it's ever actually happened. So uh, as far as the context or the why behind the bill, I would gladly uh, invite the chief to come speak to that as well. Thank you. A uh, couple different things. I can't speak to the why behind the bill because we have the same question. When the attorney general basically said, we still have that reasonableness standard when we're looking at compressive and prone restraints. The question from us was, well, then why was this drafted? Um, I can speak to the provisions about the removing the or from the bill. That's a concern. Um, it's no secret to us in law enforcement either that there, we have many students who may have had adverse interactions or experiences with law enforcement. No doubt about it. We, we get that. How do you fix that, though? You fix that by developing those relationships, right? And if we're not developing those relationships, that divide continues to grow. The SROs are not just there as a security presence, as a safety presence. They are there to bridge the gap and help develop those relationships between public safety and students so they can understand um, that a lot of our kids also, they're only com comfortable coming to school resource officers. I'm certainly not, that's not a poke at school staff by no means. But whatever the situation is, maybe they're living with that home or whatever that may be, this provides someone who has the legal um, authority to do something about whatever that situation they may be dealing with this. I cannot tell you how many letters from not only schools but from students that I have had directed to me about the work that our SROs have done to help them in their personal lives get guidance and direction in their life, um, help them with the situation at home. All those things where they have an immediate conduit of a familiar face that they can talk to, they no longer have that now. And they don't have that outlet short of calling 911 to speak to the authority figure. Whereas it's, it, it, when we have those school resource officers with those relationships, it's much easier to do that. And, and I could provide letter after letter <laughs> of right, that. My so, question is more yeah. about why pull out of schools completely when you can still, you yeah. know, you can still do yep. all of those functions for yep. this very other narrow. Absolutely. I see what you as, as more so just for those few scenarios, okay? Um, because you're still risking liability by not getting involved as a peace officer. If you're sitting there in that school and you're being told you're not going to respond to this or you're walking down the hallway and that situation does happen, you are governed by those rules that inherently puts you at risk. Regardless of whether staff calls you or whether you are just walking down the hallway and something happens and you have to stop and make that split-second decision about, okay, what am I going to do here? And, um, and they don't, and putting staff at that risk and that liability risk, you know, we're all getting opinions from our city attorney. We're all getting opinions from the League of Minnesota Cities or if you're self-insured or if you're a county, whatever that may be. And everybody has trepidation with this and there's a reason for that. And they, their risk level is some people have a greater tolerance for that risk and others don't. So does that make that. Yeah, and you did mention that there are some agencies that are staffing schools with officers that will call out yep. if they feel like a physical confrontation will occur. Bloomington is just one example. Mm -hmm. In your scenario, why is that not feasible? Is it a philosophical, like, we don't want to have to deal with that kind of thing, or is it yep. a staffing issue where you don't have enough the officers? It's the liability it? piece of it. It right. really comes down to the liability and the safety piece of it. So, um, And we are trying to work every department that's not putting SROs back in school is still trying to do something to have some type of presence or dedicated patrols, everyone that I've talked to anyway, including us, if, if we're not back in the schools, um, we are still trying to do something to try to ensure for the safety of our students. It just will not be that active um, personal connection. Well, just, me on, well, can you let me on what some of those other things are like? Yes, having officers stationed around schools is I think what I hear you saying. And what other sort of 
relationships are you building with schools to maintain that connection? We already do regular in, with the districts we have um, that we work with. We have regular safety and security meetings for things like emergency planning in the event we ever do have critical incidents, um, setting things up. So we have. Um, not only practices and policies in place, but reunification measures, all those types of things. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that affect the schools as well, um, where the, that could be medical related as well. When a student has a medical emergency, and now you don't have that SRO inside the building, you're waiting for a 911 call for an officer to get there. To, and not to say we don't have you know um, school medical staff, but those officers who are trained to get there, whether it is. Um, with the defibrillator or medical supplies, Narcan, you know, all the schools have Narcan in them now too, um, as of the, the, you know, the recent session. Um, but the officers are trained to deal with those situations. We administer as Narcan as an example. When we're on the street and we have to administer Narcan, it's not always pleasant when people come out from that. Okay? And so for us to be there to respond to that um, versus the volatility of that situation is just yet another example. So. Under the current rules, were you already restricted on what you could do in terms of putting a kid in nylon restraints or, or cuffs? No, we have we already have um, statutes uh, 60906 that governs our use of force and when we may use force. And there's certain exceptions is outlined in 60906, and this is not this was not transitioned over to 60906 as one of the exceptions. So we already do have uh, accepted standards and practices for law enforcement that we do. And again, we don't want to go hands-on with anyone, you know, especially students. But the, the reality of the world we live in is that every day there are dynamic situations, um, whether it, it, is, it is criminal or whether it is social, emotional, whatever that may be, um, situations that happen in our schools every day. And I worry about the staff with this too. It's not just our, our, the students and our staff. I worry about the school staff as well, not having that resource there. I mean, you take a, a six six lineman and a, a, a five foot tall teacher, and you have a three hundred pound difference there. That could be a pretty ugly situation when you those staff don't have the tools to deal with those situations that we do. So. Can, you, can you help us understand the range of um, options officers have in terms of? a very light restraint mm -hmm. technique, and how many others might be affected by Absolutely. this rule around not being able to breathe as well? Yeah. Their we have basically progressive use of force standards, okay? So um, obviously just being verbal and being present, you know, we hope to de-escalate a situation. We try to talk. Uh, every law enforcement officer goes through de-escalation training. Um, we're getting heavily more, much more heavily involved with mental health staff. But then we can go, um, you know, Certainly, you can step things up, so to speak. If you have to go hands-on and escort somebody or something is starting to escalate, I talked earlier about that situation where there's a fight in the hallway that's maybe going to start but hasn't started yet. That SRO can go in, try to break them up. If they continue, they can grab them by the arm and escort them down to the office, okay? Considered a use of force now. So what are we going to do? Are we just going to not do that and hope for the best and wait for punches to be thrown before we physically intervene? I and mean, we don't want to intervene. The hope is that we can talk things down. Um, but then certainly from there, you, you know, we can escalate not only from physical holds and escorts um, to a little more dynamics, whether that's takedowns, um, whether that is having to result to using a taser or something that's very rare in the schools. It has happened, but it's very rare. And um, you know, I talked to one of our school resource officers at one of our high schools saying, just out of curiosity, let's take fights, for instance. How many fights a week do you have in the high school? They said usually about two to three, okay, on average a week. I said, how many of those is it necessary for you as a school resource officer to get involved in versus the staff managing that situation? School resource officer said about half. Okay, now that's one school. I get that. That's one school, but that's one to, one to two incidents a week where that school resource officer is necessary to intervene in that situation because staff couldn't handle that themselves. Taking cops out of our schools, nobody wants to do that. We want to be there. We just want to be comfortable working under the rules to protect our staff as well as the students. Probably got one or two more questions. Yeah. I feel like I'm taking everything here. <laughs> You're talking about the, the number of incidents here, and there's been this parents and community members, there have been some that have been critical of this, inciting even the era of mass shootings that we're dealing with, that police are putting the safety of their own officers over the safety the kids in the community that they're entrusted to protect and serve. How would you respond to that? Which is exactly why we're trying to do what we can to have workarounds. And even these departments that 
are not having officers in the schools. Um, everyone I'm talking to is gonna try to have them a presence in the area, encouraging frequent walkthroughs by our patrol officers to try to have a presence to ensure the safety of our kids, particularly for a critical incident like that, but still trying to minimize the liability. The other thing we have to consider is if we have school resource officers who are not comfortable going into this, do we force them to do that? when they don't want to be exposed to that legal liability, that's a consideration for the law enforcement agencies and for the employers as well. But, so we are trying to still have a presence, um, and you know, again, heaven forbid something like that happen, um, but it just won't look like what it will look like before. What will that look like exactly? So, well, I can only speak to in Blaine, and again, we are still waiting for council action um, tomorrow in Blaine, um, but in Blaine, what we are looking at doing is dedicating officers to school zones who will actively patrol zones, do regular walkthroughs, but be clear that they are not under a contractual basis with those schools. And again, you know, our intent is we have heard um, a number of districts, and this is not just one area of our state that wants school safety. This is across our entire state. And I listed those off that we knew of um, either last night or earlier this morning. It is definitely changing, and I have been in communication with uh, one of my uh, a chief from a neighboring area and a superintendent and a mayor that have said, we are ready to go with a statement. We won't, don't want to do this. We are calling on the legislature and the governor to please call a special session. Even the questions that you've heard today, it is very, very clear that this is not it's too ambiguous. This is not what we can do. I do happen to have the language here, and I apologize for not stepping up earlier, um, but I do have the bill language here because that's really important to me that we are talking about this. As we're talking about SROs, it is not just SROs that we're talking about. It is, and they do a great job. This is also an employee or agent of a district, including a school resource officer or a police officer contracted with the, dis with the district. I think it's important to know that when we have a situation, and I too am a former school board member, and I know there's a number of us, when we have a situation that is escalating within a building, yes, we would like our SRO to be there, and we know that that will change the dynamic. But I also wanna know that there is a school employee that can step in before we are talking about bodily harm or death with one of our students or one of our staff. And I think that is a very important thing to remember. We need our governor to go ahead and call a special session, to go ahead and fix this issue. We cannot have our schools, our students, our staff waiting for six more months to figure out something that we already know is an issue because the Attorney General has stepped in, the Governor has been answering questions, we need this answered now. We could have this done in just a couple of days. Our Governor has called special sessions throughout his entire time as Governor. This is priority. We need school safety in Minnesota. One more for Senator Duckworth and then I know our, I told guys we'd be done by noon so we do have to wrap it up after that. Uh, Senator Duckworth, who's the DFLer that you're working with? Uh, Senator John Hoffman, and he represents uh, a school district that uh, is uh, impacted by this, and uh, he's also a, a former school board member, uh, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> which just goes to show uh, how bipartisan this is. Folks, we have to remember, in emergency situations, minutes matter. Seconds matter. And it, it, it breaks my heart when I think of the kids and teachers and staff we're talking about when I hear the chief come up here and describe the fact that he and other agencies are having to look at workarounds are having to try to establish police patrolling zones rather than having SROs in buildings where they can immediately diffuse situations, keep people safe, and deter and prevent instances from escalating. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we want to reset to. That's what our bill would do. It's a simple repealer. It's not a political statement. It doesn't get into the weeds on anything. It simply says, let's go back to where we were before this was an issue. Let's fix it. Uh, that's what we're seeking to do. We're asking for the governor's help to do that before school starts. This is timely. This is urgent. It's unacceptable. It is not an answer, and it's a failure of leadership in the eyes of parents when we say we're going to wait six months or more to solve an issue that has immediately uh, impacted school districts and school buildings. So that's what we're hoping to solve. Uh, I think we're going to see, hopefully, Republicans and Democrats come to the table to do it. Uh, I know they're just as interested in a speedy fix as we are. I'll put it to you this way. I don't know why. 
I don't know why the governor wouldn't call a special session to fix this issue, especially when you have both leaders from our caucuses saying, we'll keep it singularly focused to this, we'll expedite it, and we'll get it done because we're willing to put the safety of our kids first. I know Senator Duckworth, I'm sure Representative Dameth are available for follow up. Well, anyone can, can we get a copy of that? I will proposed, send out a copy of the bill yeah, just to know which as well as exactly. the language as it was changed because I think that'll be helpful for Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I should have done that first. I'll take care of it. Thank you. Thank you guys.